Has it begun? It has begun. Welcome to the CTB show. Today is somewhere around mid-August. The weather is seasonably hot as shit and fuck. I don't have a third thing. <laughs> My name is Evan the Mayor. That is Brian the Levy. Evan, you weigh 168 pounds. Mm-hmm. At the moment, I weigh 176 pounds, mm -hmm. and yeah. I will not be happy until I flip those sixes and sevens, and I weigh less than you. Just thought you should know. You're still shorter than me. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and that is Casey the Cason. I'm not allowed to use my catchphrase anymore, so I guess I just have to settle for being the heaviest member of this show. Oh, there you go, Casey. No poops. All right, episode 326 for you today. Top of the show plugs. Guys, I don't know if you know this, but Union Craft Brewery has reopened, and they are taking reservations to hang out there, and they have a new beer. It is entitled the Enchanted Forest Hazy IPA. I sampled one on this past Thursday. It's uh, it's an IPA. It's got some very good labels. You've had it before. And colors. It's great. It Go. references a thing you remember. It references a thing that I remember. Uh, on this show today, a triumphant return of a very good guest. Always a good guest. One crime reporter, Pulitzer uh, nominated. Prime reporter for the Baltimore Sun, Justin Fenton, is on the show. I'm excited to talk to this man. He's like a legit guest that makes us look good. It is true, especially when we ask the right questions. But we will be asking him questions today about a television show. But also yes. some, uh, some other very important things. We've still managed to drag him into our bullshit. Right. I don't want to spoil it, so you're just going to have to wait for another 15 minutes till we get through our shout-outs, and then we'll be right back with him. Uh, however, the video of this episode will be posted to Facebook so that twos of people will leave comments, which is still more comments than the blog posts get of these episodes in audio form. By the way, please leave us a review uh, of the podcast on your platform of choice. We never asked you to do it, so do it now. Maybe we'll start doing that. And or uh, subscribe on our YouTube page and or join the CTB FamZone Extreme... <laughs> Do you, do you think enough people, like the nine or ten that may have done it, voted for us in the Best of Baltimore um, nomination phase? Uh, I honestly think that unless you're like a Baltimore sports podcast and those things seem to have a very short lifespan. They multiply if you get them wet, though. Like, that you is can't true. Feed they are you can't feed them after midnight. Uh, but do they have COVID QVAs hit, like Ismo? I'm not entirely sure what all these homegrown sports podcasts are doing because most of them are dudes that live in Owings Mills and all their kids are home. So I don't know how much time they've got to uh, do any podcasting about this. I've heard that they're drinking heavily and beating their wives, so you know, you'll <laughs> never know. Don't vote for them. Or that. I, heard that. I heard they said all lives matter. I'm just saying, vote for us. Yeah, We're on the right course. side of history. I think we might be, at least in some cases. Yeah, fingers crossed. Down some episodes from about But there. not burning crosses. Oh. My cat just did a thing where she took a shit and then ran up the stairs like she was on fire. Well, maybe she had some Chipotle and it like kind of burned coming out. If you don't want me, if you don't want me to talk about these things, you shouldn't start talking about them. <laughs> Let's talk about a cat, not your ass. Oh. That's just what happens to, to talk me. about today. What are we going to jaw about before we get to the serious stuff? So, like, I'm doing all this bike riding, right? 
Yes. And if I have learned anything, it is that everybody is smoking weed in their cars. Like, okay. I three to four times on a ride, I will smell weed. And that's not like when I'm making my stops to smoke. I'm saying, like, I will be pedaling and stuff, and there will be people just like, I'll be like, blunt, blunt, joint? Blunt, like, you know, and then, like, sometimes there are no cars around, so I'll just assume it's people on, like, their deck. But it is the, my entire route. Do you suppose now, that is because it's um, more efficient to smoke a blunt inside your own car? Well, I think it's just an enjoyable thing to do, you know. I, there's nothing I love better, like, when I was in high school or college than, like, you know, on a nice summer night, rolling the windows down, putting on some, like, Bob Seger or some shit and taking a, a blunt ride, you know. It's, it, it was, that, that's a nice way to pass a 45 minutes. Right. You know, but I'm talking about this is, like, efficiency, the, right? This is, no, no, not efficiency. It's just, a, you know, a nice, it's a nice activity. I'm, this is, like, in the middle of the day. Oh. This is this is like when I'm riding to work, you know, when I'm doing some exercising. So you're on your way in between, wait, like what area are you in when this is happening? This is like on Falls Road. Okay. You know, now I do Arthur happen. Blunts on Falls Road? I do happen to drive by, uh, to ride by the storehouse, which is a, a head shop. Um, yeah, well, no, it's not a head shop. It's like a dispensary. And it's not like a dispensary. It actually is a dispensary. Isn't uh, that like going to like get a pizza and then eating it in your car? <laughs> like, right. It's frowned upon, isn't it? I don't think. No, it's what you're supposed to do. You I know. I don't think the weed. I don't think the weed store wants you to smoke the weed in the car once you get I, it. I, I meant like, eat the pizza in the parking lot. I don't know about that. Oh, that's right. what I always get too. I eat the first one, so no one knows. That's why I got extra <laughs> fries at Mickey D's. <laughs> Uh, but again, if you go to a dispensary, is it is it rude or expected for, of you to like sample the material in your car in the front? I don't think you're supposed to do that. I'm pretty sure that's illegal. You don't right. go to a bar at, or go to the liquor store and then sample <laughs> one in your car. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> also, I think it's frowned upon because if you do that, well, then you're just a drug addict, and they don't want to, you know, they don't want to uh, uh, push that narrative. You know, if I go to the dispensary and I'm buying a couple pre-rolls, am I lighting them up in the car? I'd say that's a 70-30 shot, yes. You know, but otherwise, no, I don't think you're supposed to. Good good, uh, good tactic. I mean, tip. Let's Thanks. I, I, I don't think you should. I don't think you should. Unless you're really good at it. I mean, Brian, you were a trendsetter. You were just smoking pot, like, everywhere. I was, uh, well... That was before COVID, so it's not like I've you know I've only stopped doing that because I have to, but wow. but yeah I mean but I'm yeah I mean for always I just I've always known you know hey I'm a white man in America I'm just gonna smoke some weed on Cross Street. <laughs> Hello, fellow McGurk's patrons. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's me. I don't that's even right. think they're doing that. No, no, I, I was because I was standing outside of McGurk's. Like, oh, we're on the outside portion of uh. Fuck, what was that place next to Crazy Lil's? Um, so Grumpy's? Oh, Grumpy's. Grumpy's? We're, we're, we're outside of Grumpy's? Yes, oh, we're, we're right. going back in time. I am smoking weed on this balcony. Yeah, no, totally. Totally. Yeah, they had a balcony. I forgot about that. And I would, just wait for, I would just wait for someone to say something. And I've been hanging out in Federal Hill, Hills since, what, 2006? And I'm still waiting. I am not hanging out in Federal Hill in 2020 because, boy, howdy. I mean, aside from the outdoor seating... Some dummies. A lot of dummies. Well, everybody's getting COVID. Did you see that? You see that um that school in Georgia? Oh, where all the kids are literally just crammed into the hallway. Yeah, like like a fucking bunch of sardines. How long until and the then kids there's start like dying? a bunch of people that got COVID that day? Yeah, right? It's nuts. Casey, <laughs> what do you send fucking you send Canada is going to on. Oh, right. What happens when COVID mixes with chlamydia? Like that's what's happening in Sturgis right now. Covidia, uh, Casey. All those favorite. All those aging Sturgis. with hepatitis C. Yeah. Anyway, Casey, your favorite band, Sturgis, huh? Smash Mouth. 
<laughs> oh, that. Uh, guys, what, is that, what does that say for bikers if Smash Mouth is performing at Sturgis? I would like to, to uh, address the, 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 the biggest fans of our podcast that we've got right now. Send Smash Mouth stuff to Casey. We just yes. have a P.O. box or some sort of address that Casey can receive. Casey is dying Smash for stuff. some Smash Mouth merch. He said, I, I want a shirt that says All Star. I want to know who started this nasty rumor. I don't have enough Hallmark greeting cards that play Smash Mouth's Daydream Believer. No, I'm a believer. Dif- different monkeys song. I'm a believer. <laughs> there are too many monkeys song with the name Believer in the title. I want a, a Shrek plush that sings All Star and I'm a Believer too. Then I saw her face. I'm a believer. Oh, right. You were walking on the sun. Uh, I think we should all remember that the music video to All Star is a Mystery Men tie in. Oh, yeah. It, it is the members, it is a superhero audition to join the said Mystery Men. Uh, and the band Smash Mouth shows up to audition for some. Yeah. Uh, they're not, they're a band. They're not superheroes. Uh, who would win in a fight? The guy from Smash Mouth, I believe his name is Steve. Or, or Guy Fieri. Oh, God. Oh. Well, aren't they the same person? I've never seen them in the same room at the same time. Oh, prove me wrong. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. We're going to talk know, about an unsolved mystery. I was going to say, we're going to talk about some Freemason fucking conspiracy bullshit. When are those two going to at least hold hands? Is That's Steve all I want from to know. Smash Mouth and Guy Fieri the same person? And remember, it's Steve question mark. Not entirely sure what his name is. It, it's, it seems as good as any answer. Anyway, the title of this episode is Smash Mouth colon Casey's favorite band. No, it is not my I favorite story. Smash it's Mouth not. memorabilia to Casey, uh, 3102 Dundalk. <laughs> The North Pole. Dundalk, Maryland. 2813 Dundalk. Just send it to Casey Dundalk. <laughs> Just put Casey on it. They'll know where to go. K- Casey Dundalk. They know where they know where to find me. No, no, no. The package just has a Smash Mouth <laughs> logo on it and it says Casey. And they're like, I know where to send it. <laughs> I heard about these guys in the Best of Baltimore magazine of uh, Reader's Poll. I know exactly what's happening here. <laughs> What is, I've gone back and listened to all of their episodes. Yeah, what is what is the uh, the deadline for that? When are they going to announce like the readers' poll winners? Because we'll we'll probably get in third because we literally had three votes. I'll, I'll, you know what? As soon as we're hold on, hold on. I, I'm still here. My video is going away. Uh, okay. I'm I'm googling it. Best of Baltimore. Google. 20, Google away. Google, I'm googling. Uh, I visited this page on July 22nd. Guys, good news. Uh, voting closes August 14th. Oh. Um, so we should probably post this again. Look, all you got to do is this best podcast, the City That Breeds show. Um, you can say the City That Breeds podcast uh, entertainment show if you like. Uh, City That Breeds thing I listen to. Just I think the important words are City That Breeds. So I guess we should probably get this up before the 14th. Today's the 11th. Oh, yeah. It'll, it'll be up tomorrow. Okay. And we should probably post it on the fam zone again. Uh, that is also true. Great. Good work. I think we did it, guys. I think we, we did it. it. We, we won. We just, it, proved, uh, we just proved that we're Baltimore's best podcast. Uh, not any – you know what? I know you're all going to vote for some fucking dumb shit from NPR. Like, we talked to this steel drum player from Remington, and we're sure that we know the secrets of life. The secrets of life is drum and mon. Like, come on. Like, give me a fucking break. The problem is that now... And I know what you think. That voice was racist? Wrong. That steel drum player was white, so he's a oh. douchebag. In COVID times, the amount of podcasts have simply just gone like up the asymptote it is we're at peak podcast it's insane. this is going this is going to age badly because my shout outs are to two podcasts so which is fine i mean there are good ones but there are too many of them i can't i cannot listen to all of them and then some people are starting podcasts and then immediately selling them to cbs i think 
Yeah, or something to that effect. Meanwhile, we've been doing this for, oh, I'm checking my watch here, seven and a half years and struggling. Just kidding. I'm not, this is my favorite part of the week. Yeah, it's enjoyable. Um, and speaking of why we are the best podcast in Baltimore, you're about to find out. But before we do that, it's time because to- Because Evan knows people. Celebrate. Internet sensation. So we've not yet. Yeah. He might know people, Casey, but then we like really finesse them and make them feel welcome. You know, work the shaft, caress the balls. Shout outs. This is the part of the show in which you take a break. <laughs> Matt Props, aka shout outs to persons, places, and things that are giving us jollies, improving our quality of life. Uh, I got two shout outs this week. Number one to uh, curry chicken made with uh, chicken thigh meat. Mm. Yummy. My other uh, shout out is to the podcast that I just guested on earlier today before we did this podcast. Wait, what? Yeah. I, I mentioned uh, four. They unfortunately uh, only had four contestant slots available, and it's a game show, it's a quiz show, it's improv based, and I won. Thank you. Uh, it's yeah. called We Must Ask You, or if I'm getting that wrong, I'll put it in the show notes. Sorry, Jonathan, but he's going to be on the show, and Brian. You and I, and maybe Casey, uh, we might be doing a team up with dissecting the '80s soon. Ooh. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I'd like to be involved with everything, just so we all know. You know, we can. I'll come to your house. We can yeah, just sit no. next to each other. I tried. We, we should do this as a team. I literally forgot that I was doing this until 20 minutes before it happened. Excellent. And then Good you work. Won. Say what? And then you won. I did. Ask, ask me one of the questions. It wouldn't have been. It, it wouldn't have worked if we were both on it because we're on the same show and the other guy was on a different show. Oh. So can't compete with one another. Another. However, if we had had two people in the same video screen, but the other guy had only had one, anyway, it wouldn't have worked. The what was one of the questions? One of the one of the que- and, and the topic was booze. Um, boobs? I would have nailed it. Boobs, yeah, booze. <laughs> oh, booze. What is the best thing you can do with a whiskey barrel? Put a body in it. Mm, you're close to the right answer. Age whiskey. That was the other guy's guess. What's the answer? Well, it's already been posted on the internet, and I will tell you the winning answer was ride it off a waterfall, baby. Okay. Waterfalls. Don't go chasing waterfalls. If you would like to see that winning answer and all of my other winning answers, uh, pay attention to the blog post and or anywhere else this link is posted and you'll have a link to the show. I don't think the podcast itself is posting for another day. So, sorry. Anyway, we'll be teaming up with those guys soon. Who's next? Well, this seems to be the week of shouting out podcasts, but my shout outs are to an oral history of The Office. It's very entertaining, very cool stuff. And also starting the last week or so, uh, Zach to the Future, in which Mark Paul Gosseler watches Saved by the Bell for the first time, co-hosted with the guy who made Zach Morris's Trash. So how, it is very entertaining. I have questions. Like, how did he avoid Saved by the Bell? For the- he, doesn't like to, he doesn't like to watch himself work. Oh, okay. You know? Like many actors and actresses, but I just call them actors because women are people too, Casey. You're just going to nod? Cool. Good. You're just going to nod. Uh, <laughs> Got to go back on my note. The, the name of the podcast is We Have to Ask. We Have to Ask Podcast. And they had you on. Yes, they asked me specifically. Well, I'm the funny one, so that's surprising. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Brian, you've been muted. Oh, but Brian doesn't know people. Casey, what do you got? Uh, he's talking uh, muted, so that's funny. Um, I, I, this little uh, shout out to this little thing from Route One Apparel. They're doing a giveaway. It's a little. Oh, it's merch. I don't know if you could. Yeah, Put it in front of your face. There, there you go. go. It's a, old 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 video. Travel tin of Old Bay that you put <laughs> on your keychain in case okay. you need some Old Bay to go. No, Casey, that's not for Old Bay. That's for cocaine. <laughs> Silly baby. That's for cocaine, Casey. 
I mean, I, I, I think you should probably wash it out real good. You don't want to be snorting like old Bay residue unless no, you do. <laughs> but no, that's you have cocaine. to add the old Bay yourself, actually. Oh, then fuck it. It's just for cocaine. <laughs> At no point in time has that thing ever been for old Bay. It's just for cocaine. All right, then. And that is- well, I mean, because aren't, the like, aren't they like a college what? apparel company? Something like that. Yeah, those college kids love some nose beers. Those beers. All right, that has been the uh, first 15 minutes of this awesome episode. We will be right back after a little thing we like to call the bumper. What's the bumper going to be, guys? Uh, They're those things that you put in the gutters of a bowling alley, but that's not important right now. Gotcha. Brian, I thought you said you were the funny one. Ouch, Casey, thanks. Yeah, oh, fucking burned, dude. <laughs> uh, guys, good news. Burned, uh, our, our friend Ethan just posted an SBNA, too. That was me. That's a, th- that's a thing you've made? I wanna... my, my old SB... neighbor. Yes. Yes, I, I just recently renamed a group that I started to be the sequel group to the group that just got archived. You know what? But But... That group has needed a shakeup, so this is great timing for it. Tell you what, God bless a certain someone for throwing a Molotov cocktail into that group and causing all sorts of things to happen. You you are now the uh, administrator of the premier uh, South Baltimore community group uh, in South Baltimore. Congratulations. (laughs) No, I'm not. No, actually, this group is smaller than a different group. Anyway, who cares? All right, we will be right back after this non-bumper because we just made bumper jokes. All right, we are back from break. We are joined by a very good friend of ours, of the show, and in life in general, Justin Fenton. Say hello. Hi, guys. Happy to see you. Hello. Welcome back to the show. It's been entirely too long. In fact, I think the last time you were on this show, we were talking about the upcoming consent decrees and it was a live show at wind up space and that was a million years ago no we've had them on post that have we i'm sh- i'm sure of it yeah we've interacted so. in real life but uh yeah at any rate i think the i think we've had you on the last six to eight months probably before i went on the book leave because i didn't have a lot to talk about while i was doing that but uh yeah yeah <laughs> we will certainly get into that you know, we f- we first need to dabble in the uh, the realm of the the top topics of middle-aged white ladies in America right now, and it's unsolved mysteries. However, before that, uh, there was a very significant explosion in Northwest Baltimore uh, this past week. This week, whatever. What's it, yesterday? I don't even know what time it is. It was yesterday. yesterday. <laughs> and uh, you were on the scene. Like, what the shit did that look like, and how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, it was pretty, uh, we heard that there was an explosion, that that houses had blown up. They said three blocks had been affected, so I wasn't quite sure sort of what I was going to be walking into. But, um, you know, um, three houses just completely wiped away. Um, and these are adjoined houses in a, in a neighborhood that, it's not a, not too dense, but the houses are on top of each other. They're saying it was a gas explosion. Um, there's now two people dead, uh, five people critically injured, and two others hurt. Um, I mean, I, w- what I always try to do when I go to a crime scene is wherever they don't want me to go. You know, they, they sort of to keep us out, but I'm always trying to find like the pressure point of like somewhere that they forgot to put it up so that I can reasonably say, oh, I didn't know I wasn't allowed to be here. I, there was no tape. So I didn't find that entry point. I was able to get inside the scene. And as I walked closer to the actual like middle of it, I mean, there were broken glass everywhere in all the front yards because all the windows in the houses near there got blown out. Um, doors got blown off the hinges and so you're walking you're walking up and as you get closer the damage is getting more significant so the first house you see their windows are blown out and their blinds are sort of tangled then you see another one and like all their windows are blown out and the door is like knocked into the back of the house and and then when you stood there I mean it was just really um it was really uh uh striking because they didn't look like homes I mean you couldn't I didn't see like people's possessions it was just like cinder blocks and bricks and, and insulation and, and just like and, and you're, 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 you're looking at it thinking there's no way anybody, if anybody's trapped in it, there's no way that they're alive. And so I was standing there watching as the firefighters very specific, like deliberately looked like they were 
trying to get to something. They, they weren't just picking through stuff. They weren't just sort of, you know, sifting through. Like, look, they look very dedicated. And I'm watching and I'm watching and I see a body coming out. And I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be a dead body. I'm going to see them carrying a dead body out. And there was a woman on a stretcher and she was moving her arms. And as far as we know, she's alive. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty like emotional moment. Cause I, I really did think I was going to see like someone being pulled out of there who's dead and to see someone come out alive. It's, it's, it, I mean, it's a miracle. So um, we're still trying to figure out what exactly happened and that could take forever. But um, you know, it's a, it was a pretty big story. We had international media here, you know, um, a lot of coverage of it. And um, you know, it's, it's a, especially after what happened in Beirut, you know, like you sort of like, it obviously <laughs> not nearly on the scale but you're thinking about that right you're thinking as i'm driving up i'm like what if what if there's another one like what if this gas line is ruptured and it blows up this shopping center that's right here like you, you all those things go through your head you wonder if it's safe but, but luckily it was you know that was the end of it but uh, it was pretty bad for what it was i was gonna say it's even a little crazier due to covid because everyone is at home and right. you know the gas and that- happens while everyone's at work like maybe the you know, occupant of that building might you know, get blown up but but either way it, it's it was at like what nine o'clock eight thirty even if people are sitting down to do their work from home office jobs that's when they're sitting down to do it you know and and kids are on a summer break and they're waking up at 10 and yeah every everybody's home uh just one of the interesting things i saw was that like a lot of different like facebook rumors like you know people are like oh bg and e had been out there like three weeks earlier and said, everything's fine. Have you heard any stuff like that? No, I mean, bg and is trying to say that they don't believe it's a gas leak on their end. They're not denying that it's a, it's a gas related problem. And by the way, if you haven't seen the ring video, someone on a ring doorbell. Yeah, I saw that. I mean, it looks like a geyser going straight up into the air. I mean, it's going like a hundred feet in the air. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, and I don't know how they even go about figuring out this kind of stuff because the, the the crime scene or whatever you want to call it is like it's completely destroyed so I, i'm not sure what we do know is that the homes all three were owned by the same person in their rental properties and, and there was some talk about the homes having been renovated but i you know again i i, I would just be speculating we're not sure sort of what 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 exactly caused it but bg is trying to say you know wasn't our equipment in the sense that like we failed to fix a leak or something like that did you mark yourself safe on Facebook from the explosion? I, I did not. And I saw, I saw some people doing that. And, you know, it's one, one of those things where, like, you're trying to convey the scope of the damage. And, like, you know, we're saying how all these houses are affected. But at the end of the day, it, 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 you know, I heard people were getting phone calls from family members in other states and things. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that kind of an issue. It's like, yeah, dude, you're in Parkville. We know. You're fine. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the houses, like, around the corner just had their windows blown out. Like, it, it's that bad but um yeah well going from that tragic news to some more i don't know tragic news tragic pop oh, culture it's all, news it's all tragic when i'm on yeah sorry everybody. that's that's true you you do work in the profession of tragedy unfortunately. but it's damn interesting i mean you know. <laughs> that's, that's very true brian uh so hey have you heard this about this you seen this uh oh, on the cut on the cutting edge two weeks late yeah, well, no, if you want to really push it forward, it's, a, it's like a month and a yeah. week late. Um, but if you really want to get honest, it's 14 years late because this, uh, this, right. mur- this murder, this whatever it is, I just don't remember this at all. And uh, it's, it's a mystery, an unsolved mystery. Netflix reboot the series. It becomes a viral sensation. Uh, First episode takes place in Baltimore. A man who works for a publication company uh, mysteriously perishes after plummeting from the roof of the Belvedere Hotel, question mark, uh, and falls through a hole in a conference room that is uninhabited and stays there for nine days, uh, decaying. Mystery in is, six days, six days, six days. Sorry, mystery is afoot. Um, fast forward. From 2006 to 2000, I don't 18. I don't know when they they filmed this stuff. Netflix, uh, uh, and the the episode goes viral this past month, and then it lands on your desk. How? <laughs> well, uh, it's always interesting to me when these cases from Baltimore's past. I mean, you could think about serial. You think about the keepers. You think about unsolved mysteries. I think there's been others that just be, all of a sudden become featured on these these national shows and all of a sudden the whole country in fact the whole world is talking about them and like you know i'm not trying to undermine 
significance of the, of the case. But I, you know, I'm not sure it was that big of a case here. And all of a sudden, 14 years later, it's like it's like the talk of the country. So uh, I hadn't actually seen the show. Um, and I got a call from a lawyer in town who I've worked with before. I don't know him particularly well, but he's he's someone that I've interacted with in past stories. And he's like, I got you know, I got something that a lot of people want to know about. Uh, does, his, he he to, does his name rhyme with uh, Shmary Schmlazer? <laughs> no, although, <laughs> although I was in touch with him for the first time over the phone a couple weeks ago for something else, but that, that's for another day. Uh, that's, that's the story that I don't know if you guys saw where someone is accused of like faking their exoneration of murder. Uh, that, that's a pretty interesting one. But um, anyway, on, 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 on this case, there was a guy who was at the center of the show. He's sort of this, he's painted as this mysterious character who like won't, you know, won't won't talk to anybody. He won't explain himself. He declined interviews, and uh, and he um he, he he wanted to speak. You know, his 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 attorney was putting him forward, and so you know, again, I you know, I don't put this out there to sort of say that he's right or wrong or people should believe him, but I wanted people to I wanted to introduce this into the conversation so that everyone who was picking over the case on uh, you know Reddit and and Reddit. <laughs> that would, would have this information to to further pick over. I think it's important to run down this story, right? So there's yeah. this guy, and he's working for the, and, and he's working for this like financial newspaper thing, you know, newsletter thing. You know, they email it out in the morning and they say, "Buy this stock, don't buy that stock," you know. So then he's he's got this uh, boss, and the boss is his best friend. And then all of a sudden, like his wife is on a business trip, and he runs out of the house, and like like we said, he's found dead six days later. To, uh, jumped off the Belvedere Hotel, maybe, who knows. Um, but the way the story is told, like you're just sitting there waiting for this best friend on Unsolved Mysteries to say something. And it's like, boy, they've talked to, you know, the mother, the brother, the, the, the wife. They've talked to a lot of people. They haven't talked to this best friend yet until finally they just flash on the bottom of the screen. Uh, who's his face? Did not make himself available for comment. And it's like, huh. Okay, I get that message that you're sending me on Solved Mysteries. But right. Then, there, at there a certain a, point, a few of the things that that Justin's article came, you know, brought to light. First of all, somebody else wrote a book about this case, and years ago. But yeah, and I well, two years ago, and I guess the line from that that book, and then one of the sticking points of the episode was it would have been very hard for this person to get on the roof of the Belvedere and launch himself that far in order to punch a hole in another roof. Um, and basically, one of the, the ideas was, you know, there's security, there's cameras, there's this. Nobody ever saw this guy. And one of the, the, the author of this book basically said, oh, no, you can get in there. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, she, she, so she's a resident of the Belvedere, and she's a writer. And she had been interested in this story for years just because, just out of pure curiosity, you know, what happened to this guy? You know, I, I was living there. We didn't, we didn't hear anything. And so she spends years looking into it and really interviewing some of the people involved and, and sort of immersing herself in the story and tells this first person story of like wanting to know what happened. But ultimately, you know, so, so she's able to tell from a first person perspective that in fact, the roof is accessible, that the bartenders at the 13th floor, which is the bar on the, the top floor and other places, you know, they always prop open the door with cinder blocks and it's always open and you can always go up there. And, and so, yeah, she, it's just, she said she was interviewed for the show and they didn't air it. And she felt mm. like they didn't want to air, you know, this other side of the story. Uh, you know, I don't know what the, the, the producers didn't get back to me. Um, but, you know, she, she concluded that she thought that he had, in fact, jumped. And, and, and it's oh. it clear. I mean, there's certainly strange things about the case, things that probably will never be, be answered. But the thing that the friends told me, you know, was that they really felt like, you know, in fact, you know, I think that he's portrayed in the episode as everything was fine. He had everything right. to be happy about. He was new. You know, he's, 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 there's no signs of any trouble. And they were like, no, there was, he, he had some serious uh apparent you know creeping mental illness and and we we think that that's what happened to him um it's, so it, it's a deliciously pulpy story i mean yeah. i mean this is the exact kind of thing that like if this had happened in l in in, in hollywood in 1930s we'd be talking about this forever um but one of my one of the things i really found the most fascinating is like you said he was what like 30 32 or something yeah this is when men like begin to exhibit, I think this is when, uh, I think it's, this might be all, when all people begin to exhibit certain kinds of mental illness. And he wrote that amazing, like amazingly weird note 
Um, they I feel like behind a computer, not like left out for everybody to find, like shrunk down, typed, shrunk down, put in a plastic bag and taped on the back so of the monitor. Great. I feel like the story that they're not telling is about a guy slowly going nuts believing in some kind of gigantic eyes wide shut Freemason type conspiracy and taking a header off the building. It's amazingly tragic, but they tried to, they tried, they leaned much too hard on the sordid aspects of the whole thing. But it's a much better story that way when the, the guy who works for the shady publication uh, might be d dabbling his toes in the wrong kinds of companies that might want to be making millions of dollars. and he's. But telling they never even talked about that kind of stuff except for that SEC thing. Um, yeah. And, 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 and the, the guy that I talked to, his name is per Porter Stansberry, and he writes this financial newsletter. And he, he is an eccentric guy. Like the, And they didn't get into some of this stuff, which they could have, and they didn't. Um, but, you know, in order to sort of make him even more strange, he's been on Alex Jones's show, you know, he talking about how Obama was going to engineer a third term by crashing the currency. And you know, he's, what? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's got, I mean, he's an, he's a, he's an odd, uh, he's, just, he's, an, he's an unusual guy. And so, like, the fact that he didn't want to talk about this, um, you know, but then, but then, he, you know, he told me, like, the reason I didn't want to talk about it is because I want to go on a national television show and say that I think my friend killed himself. So he, you know, he, he, he provided some new details. Um, it's like, why well, don't you put it that way, you know? <laughs> well, and then a second friend also talked, like a guy who said like, his best friend, like best friend from like growing up, you know, and he's never spoken either. And he felt, he said he felt compelled to, to just finally, he, he couldn't believe that it had sort of gone from like a, I wonder what happened to Ray to I wonder if he was caught up in like a murder conspiracy and dropped from a helicopter like like thing. He like he couldn't <laughs> believe that, and he also speak out. So and I, you know again, I was scanning the Reddit threads afterwards. I was curious. I mean, I hadn't been into this the way a lot of people were, and it was interesting to see how some people were like, ah, you know, I was sort of leaning towards suicide, and this sealed the deal. And other people were like, I think this guy, this is self serving. I look at the words he uses in his statements. Like I, I feel like this, you know, there's more to look into here, and so that's you know. That's uh, how it goes, I guess. But it's, uh, it's, it's always interesting local cases sort of take take off like this, and they aren't like your you know your quote unquote like like typical Baltimore cases. They're these like oddities um, from from over the years. I, I think my I love it when Baltimore shows up in in national media. I can remember the first time I really remember it was a book of ghost stories, and they talked about uh, Black Aggie in it, and I'm like, hey, that's where I live. I know that place, <laughs> you know. I, I just feel like a country cousin every time it happens. They said yeah, my they, town. They said that, my town. That statue was apparently molested so frequently they had to, like, move it. It's in the same warehouse as the Ark of the Covenant. Right. <laughs> uh, now, what I can't get, what I can't wrap my head around, and I think it came out in your article, Justin, was that, so, he, police, the detectives approached this guy initially, and he didn't want to, like, he didn't want to be interviewed by the police. And that was the gentleman that was actually on the episode of Unsolved Mysteries. But then he gets replaced. And now all of a sudden, he, according to the article, your, your article, he, he makes himself available. And so what, uh, is that common? Like for well, someone I, that, not that's, Yeah, that, that's, un, that's still unclear to me, to be honest. I mean, I think the detective was one of the most compelling parts of the show because it wasn't just the family it wasn't just the widow saying that this was suspicious. The police detective who had the case is on television saying, yeah, I think this is suspicious. I think the evidence was staged. I mean, that's very compelling. How often does that happen? Um, was he, so, is, you know, is he still active or is he retired? He is retired from the police department. He works for the uh, corrections uh, uh, okay. agency now doing investigations. And I did not get a chance to speak with him. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, to the extent to, like, was there a misunderstanding? Did the guy really not talk to him? Because 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 Stansberry says that's not true. Like I was completely available. Like I was available for anything they needed me for. I was involved in the search efforts. I hired a private investigator. I was out there personally. Some of my employees like found him. Like we we didn't like have anything to hide. And so I was asking him, well then well, then why is this detective under the impression that you were you had lawyered up and you wouldn't you wouldn't help with anything. And he's like, I, I don't know what to tell you other than I did talk to the police once that guy was off the case and they didn't have any, even any questions for me. At that point, the the new detective, you know, believed it was a suicide and there really wasn't much to probe. So, I mean, that's a, that's a question that I think only the, the two of them can really answer. But I, I wonder if there's a, 
I wonder if there's a third option, like maybe he called an employee and the employee said, I'm not supposed to talk to you because they, they thought their bosses wouldn't want them to, but there wasn't actually a directive from the top down saying that. I, I feel like that's typically the, the answer, like there's some like third option, but I, you know, I, I wasn't able to, 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 to pin that down. Mm. Did you get to see the letter? No, no, no. I mean, didn't they, didn't they show it like from afar? Didn't they like, like zoom yeah. and zoom in? Yeah. I want to read the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, if you go on Reddit, I'm pretty sure somebody's like freeze framed it and then like transcribed mm. it. And Enhancing. Then, freeze frame. Enhance. 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 <laughs> so yeah, I guess the two, uh, uh, the, the one thing obviously that makes this the most mysterious are the, the mind boggling physics behind behind the whole thing. You know, his flip flops are intact, his phone's intact, his glasses are intact, his money clip is missing. So and they said, and they said, so he was, so like, let's say that he was, he did jump, and he jumped from the, the top roof of the Belvedere, where he landed, or where the, the hole was, was forty feet away. Like, just it doesn't make sense that like he just like wouldn't be able to like just physics, like you said, so wouldn't be able to make there it. There was another there. balcony which was slightly closer, but even from that vantage point, if if you're going to accept that he was thrown. How the heck are, is any number of people going to get on that balcony with a knocked out six foot five, 260 pound man and throw him from that balcony? Or alternatively, if there are at a minimum three people that have dead weight on their hands, six foot five, 260 pounds, they're going to launch it 40 feet? I don't know. It's but, like The Rock on that skyscraper poster. That's right. <laughs> But isn't it? I mean, you don't just drop. I mean, if you were if you were to jump, you don't just go straight down. I mean, you you travel, you continue to the farther, the higher the the height, the more, the more the distance you continue to travel if you're propelled forward. Correct. Justin's right. It's geometry that I just can't do. Well, <laughs> funny you should say that because we were uh, prepping for the show this morning, and and we did consult with a mechanical engineer that did the, the velocity and the Newtons and all this stuff and the impact damage and did kind of confirm that it would be possible for a person to go through that roof feet first. You know, I, you know, I think they calculated the speed from some arbitrary amount of meters up. It wasn't arbitrary. Okay, what was it? I just... But anyway, the speed, the speed was the equivalent of like 70 miles per hour. And or some something like that, and that was that. At, seventy. At, I'm sorry. Did you say seventy or seven? Seventy. No. That, that's what, look. Right. Whatever terminal velocity. Is, right? Did the math using gravity and such and such. So it's time to try defying gravity. Right. <laughs> at any rate, I, you know, I I can't possibly imagine how all of those art the pieces that he was carrying got separated in the way they did, but it, they did say, sort of say. Well, Everything jostles out of your pocket at different times and separately. Yeah. Who knows? But, you know, they, they sort of said mathematically it could be possible for him to go through that roof that way and not actually leave a tissue sample, which also was another one of the most mind-boggling, you know, outcomes. Like, why was there not a single spatter mark, you know, where he hit or anything like that? Or why was he not completely exploded when he hit the ground? I, I, just so many questions about... The physics of the matter, but I guess the only two outcomes in my head are he pissed someone off by writing a, a newsletter. They called him up, somebody from Agora or whatever, whatever, and said like, "Hey, we need to meet you." Uh, he got met, knocked out, and thrown off a roof. Or I think it's important to mention that Agora has distanced itself very nicely from this. Uh, well, they at this point they have fourteen years. I don't know. And they know, and they say, and listen, they did not work for us. They were a subsidiary. <laughs> they are not us. <laughs> they are not us. We are not, they do not, no. Yeah, we're great. We're different. Uh, it's an important distinction to make, I think. <laughs> but, I, you know, growing up, my dad, like, subscribed to some of those newsletters. And even when I read them, I was like, ooh, this is bad stuff. Like, it, they, it's all pump and dump schemes. Some of them are fine, I'm sure. But, you know, it is, if, if you're, I, I was completely unaware that this Stansbury guy is, um, eccentric let's say but he's probably a big enthusiast of gold and uh various other you know interesting uh investments let's let's call them that alpaca uh, farms right sure but this is a company that i i historically have been familiar with in terms of their like kind of shady stuff which is why in my head it's possible that he was sort of knocked out and thrown off a roof 
Uh, but it also makes total sense that if you've got, he's got this weird letter taped behind his computer, you know, some people, when they have a break, like they, for whatever reason, are drawn to the Freemasons and lots of other strange language. So, I don't know, man. But I'm kind of leaning toward the mental break at this point. Yeah. Despite the physics involved. We won't ask Justin to, to share his opinion because that wouldn't uh, be professional. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't... Um... I feel like I, I've seen enough in my time as a reporter to like, I feel I'm, a, I'm afraid to make conclusions. There's so many sure. things that appear to be one thing and they come out to be another. What, you know, my, my, my take is that, um, you know, I, I don't know that the show presented enough facts to people, but at the same time, I think there are, even once you have all the facts, there are a lot of things that'll, that'll make you scratch your head and, 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 and wonder. But I think that, um, you know, there's, there's, there's more th there on the mental health angle that I think they explored and I think that that's relevant to the conversation even if you yeah. still think there's a lot of shady stuff going on. Uh, bigger question. That's, that's what makes the air quotes fun a ones. a big Masonic temple? Great question. Yeah. Speaking of uh, other unsolved mysteries, are there, I, 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 sorry, like most other things, it's fallen off of our collective radars, but what was the outcome with the Sean Suter case? Well, that remains a uh it's a pending open homicide uh but the police department believes it to be a suicide and they're kind of just keeping it open like well the ray rivera case is open <laughs> right i mean they, they 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 keep these cases open when there's a question that's unresolved but it's for all intents and purposes there's not uh much happening with it and that's uh one of the things i explore in my book that i mentioned earlier that's going to be coming out awesome segue sir yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, it's all intertwined. Uh, the, my my book is about the uh, the gun trace task force scandal. Say the title. Really, say the title. I was about called, to say. We, it. It's called "We Own This City," <laughs> and it's off of a quote for, that was said at trial. One of the co-conspirators with the officers said that he thought the officers owned the city. But I'm doing like a little double entendre deal because the officers felt like they owned the city, but really the people who they need to believe in them, to trust them with the information and things like that, who can help bring down the crime rate. Like they own the city ultimately, and these officers trampled on that. So I got a little, got a little double entendre thing going on. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it really tries to trace, like how do we get here? It's not just about the gun trace task force, it's about everything that led up to it. I mean, people forget that that was going on, like when Freddie Gray happened and all eyes are on the police department and the national media and the justice department is investigating the police department. That's when the gun trace tra task force scandal happened. They, like they were so completely undeterred by the spotlight, the scrutiny, because they, they didn't believe it to be actual scrutiny and, and, and uh, you know, things like that. And, and they were sort of unleashed at a period where things were supposed to be getting, getting better. And then Sean Suter gets killed. And so there's just so much going on. And I, I felt like I had to tell like the whole story, the way, I feel like I'm not unable to in this daily newspaper reporting that tends to be very incremental. And when we do tell a longer story, you know, we can only do so much. So like, I, I have a lot of interesting interviews with people who have not been heard from before that I'm really eager to get out there. And I think people are going to feel really conflicted about the whole thing, the way I am. I, I talk to so many people and, you know, just the way people described why it hadn't uh, been exposed sooner, the way they got away with it, the way it was investigated. I have like exclusive interviews with the FBI about like how they investigated the case. It's stuff that people have never heard before. It's never come out. And uh, interviews with the victims, interviews with some of the drug dealers that were being pursued that like led the FBI to fall ass backwards into this case. There's a lot of stuff there. And I'm, I, I can't believe I have to wait, what, like six months just to, to share it, but it'll It'll be out soon, <laughs> soon enough. Yeah, but, uh, February 21st. February 23rd, yeah, and you can pre-order pre it now. There's a, I, I have a cover now. The cover is on, is on Random House's website. We just picked that a couple weeks ago, so that was fun. But uh, I mean, February, Random House is a big deal. Well, I mean, this is... This, <laughs> let, let me tell you, Justin, this is a real book. I mean, is this, is, book. this is pretty exciting. No, I, 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 again, I, I hope um, my, my, my biggest concern is that it might be too dense because I felt like I'm, listen, I don't consider myself like a book writer. I did not ever really aspire to that. I don't think that I'm going to be writing more books. Maybe I will, but I really felt like this was my chance to like dump out the notebook about all the stuff that I had acquired about this case. And I wanted to get as much in there as I could. And I just hope it, you know, it's easy to read and <laughs> easy to follow and that people learn something because I, I crammed 
everything that I could, even the end notes, the end notes are this like, with this, like, if I couldn't get something into the book, I dumped it into the end notes because I wanted there to, be, I want, I don't want anyone to be like, how come you didn't address this? Like, it, it's there, read, read, it's there somewhere. I, I so just, this is this is the infinite jest of crime writing. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, Title I, of the I, episode. I, <laughs> no, I. It's like uh, there's a lot. There, there's, I mean, we we've been through a lot as a city when you put it all into one. Yeah. One, I mean, and there's a lot of stuff I didn't get into that I wish I, I could have, like. Some of the cases that were going on, it's amazing to me. The, the main character of the book is this Wayne Jenkins, who was the sergeant of the Gun Trace Task Force. And you wouldn't believe everything that was significant that was going on in the city in terms of like crime passed through this guy. It is incredible. There are cases that you have no idea. There are big cases that you've read about in the paper that, you, that seemingly had no connection to this case, but he's like in the middle of it somehow. He's in the middle of everything. And it's, it's, it's you know, one of the details in the book that I'll share now is like, when the charges are announced against the six officers charged in Freddie Gray's death, moments later, Jenkins sends out a, 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 a department-wide email to everybody telling everybody we got to raise money for their legal defense. Like he's the guy, of all people, 3,000 cops in the Baltimore Police Department, he's the guy who sends out the, the department-wide email saying, okay, everybody, dig deep. we got to raise money to help these guys defend themselves. Like, it's just it, – it was stunning to me. But, but moreover, you can see how the system's – fail and how like everybody was like sort of looking the other way and passing the buck and saying well how are we supposed to do this and and why did they, the department think that Jenkins was so great like I have e emails and stuff like that that show them having internal communications like in the moment where they're just like they're just they're enamored with this guy like he's doing such amazing things and like who would qu dare question someone who's doing such a great job so it's like I hope that it will bring a level of like depth to it that um ha that isn't there now and really tie together a lot of different things including as you as kicked off this long-winded rant of mine that the uh, Sean Suter case. Now right. the gun the gun trace task force they got brought down on like a RICO charge, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, is this almost like it's almost like a mob story? Y yeah. You know, yeah. it is. Uh, they've been using the RICO statutes against drug crews and drug cartels in recent years, and they they used it on these guys. They said, you know, listen, you guys went out as a group. And you had a plan, and you executed that plan. You covered for each other, and you're no different than the the, the drug crews that we bring down with stuff. And it's like you say, Wayne Wayne Jenkins is right there in the middle. I almost picture it like, you know, Sherlock Holmes going after Moriarty. You know, he's got this circle in the middle, and all these pieces of string going everywhere, like to this crime and this crime and this crime. And it's it's always you know, or the kingpin from Spider Man. You know, like my shirt. So it's like it's. These kind of stories are, are just so fascinating to me. Like, you know, the, you know, the spider on his web, you know. It's and and the, you know, I was really appreciative of the FBI sort of sitting down with me to walk me through how they did it because that didn't come out of trial. You know, they kind of presented the, the fruits of the FBI's efforts. Like, like, this is what the FBI found. But they didn't talk about how they found it. And they, they told me about, like, certain things that they did that did not work out where they almost blew the case. There's one part that, that I hope people uh, – I hope I emphasize enough where the, the thing almost, like – completely falls apart like it would have changed the course of history if this decision had been made and people talked to the lead to the agent out of it and it's like i mean like it, it I'll, I'll i'll talk with you about it once the book comes out or we're closer awesome to the book. put it on the calendar there's there's, there's 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 things that they did that like that, that blew up in their face and like and, and, I, and i i really told them yeah i was afraid that they wouldn't want to share that kind of stuff because they would say well why do we want to talk about stuff that went wrong and it's like because it makes you more appreciative of the journey you were on and, and that you did get to the bottom of it like that you didn't get sidetracked by that you we were able to overcome that and i think that's you know and they, everybody has really complicated perspectives on this stuff so uh again i'm i'm like i'm like the more i talk about it the more i'm, I'm eager to share it i was really worried about right during the writing process of like you know am i going to be able to pull this off and at, at this point i want to i want to put it out there and uh, you know for for everyone to pick apart and get well, something hopefully Another thing is, and, and it's hard in this moment of time to talk about, like, good police work, you know, just because of the national moment we're having. But it's really interesting to see, like, good police work that's doing the work of protecting its citizens. It just so happens to be from other police. But, but then on the other hand, how much good police work just comes down to dumb luck and, you know, what ifs and that sort of thing. Yeah, I and don't also, think... Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, and I was going to just tie back to what you were saying about the FBI or whoever it is not wanting to admit 
where they had missteps, but you know, you know, I got a background in science and negative data is data and it needs to be included in the tapestry uh, because otherwise you don't learn how to improve on the process in the future. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think that yes, the FBI investigation and the, the related county investigations that were tied into this, that started with the drug crews, that they do show like police <laughs> do the right thing. And, and I don't know, I think the GTTF is not necessarily indicative of what is going on across the police department, but what is possible if they're not kept close eyes on and aren't kept honest. It's like, this could be you. I don't know that it means everybody's doing this kind of stuff. It, I think the federal investigation has shown that it wasn't, well, at least the most extreme stuff wasn't as widespread as maybe people think. Because I think that people are under the impression that like, these eight cops got caught, but like, there's hundreds just like them. And I don't know that that's true, but I know that there was people who were sort of on the periphery who were sort of um, uh, uh, lulled into like being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of placent. impressed by these guys and or, or not not wanting to mess with them basically like sort of not wanting to you know like upset the apple cart and and i think that's that's more of what comes out and what i was able to find the people who just sort of don't want to rock the boat one one of my favorite books of all time is and movies is serpico and, and you know a lot of I mean, just it, there's just something so and, and like i said it's a national moment there's just something just so troubling about bad cops, you know, and it's, it's just, it's, uh, I'm really looking forward to reading how some get, get taken down, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, if you uh, mentioned the, actually after I wrote a series I'm really about the gun tricks. Uh, I'm going to cut this out, Paul, uh, Justin, go. No, I was just going to say, after I wrote my series on the uh, gun trace task force last summer, I got an email from Frank Serpico, which was kind of cool. Did you really? Yeah, yeah I'm actually trying to pull it up cool. right now to see if I can find it. <laughs> but anyway, did you, go ahead. Did you have to change your pants immediately? No, I was like, I was like, is this really him? Oh, wait, here it is. I, I just found it. Hold on, let me see. Oh, oh snap! He says, "Excellent article. Made me relive my past." The new ball <sighs> mission reminds me of something my chief SID Cooper said about the brass talking about police corruption. They are like a bunch of old ladies talking about the clap. <laughs> <laughs> expressed quite clearly what the problem is uh blah 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 my sadly my opinion nothing really improved if not worsened with all the rampant shooting and loss of human life while myself still unpardoned by our system of justice for my transgression against the blue wall again in my opinion these eight were not acting alone sincerely frank serpico a retired nypd detective wow that's that is wild i mean <laughs> that is so cool what a gem Oh man, how do I transition from that to saying, Casey, what were you going to say? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was kind of had this one in the chat. You were talking about the RICO charge. Are you aware of any other time that that's been used against cops? <laughs> like that just you know, seems kind of wild. I think it, so one, one interesting thing was that before the GTTF, and I don't know why it didn't get more attention, there was a group of Philly cops similarly situated, like six cops in a unit did drug work in Philly, got charged in a federal indictment by the FBI, and they all got acquitted. They all walked. And that was, so the, the, the Baltimore prosecutors are bringing this case and filing this case and getting ready to charge it right as their counterparts in Philly are watching a similar case fall apart. So they had the pressure of sort of like, you know, we don't want to go the, we don't want our case to go the way of Philly. But I don't know if those guys were in terms of racketeering per se. I know it was like very similar accusations, like shaking down drug dealers, lying, stealing, things like that. At any point, has anyone ever brought up the shield in all of this stuff? Like, yes. The, one of the things that I spent way too much time on was that, that the officers called their offices the barn, which is the name of the offices in the shield. And I was trying okay. to figure out, I was trying to figure out whether they did that deliberately or what. But so, so, someone told me yes. The, the the commander who named it deliberately named it the barn because of the shield, which is shady. And then someone else was like, no, we've called it the barn for years and no one knows why. And I don't really know what the true answer to that question is. So I ended up uh, omitting that detail <laughs> just because I didn't want it to be too incendiary if it turned out to be like, that's the name from like the 70s or something. But yeah, yeah. I mean, the shield on the LAPD Rampart scandal from the early 90s, that's what that's, you know, the LAPD had a huge scandal where like 78 cops were implicated in various things. That also has ties to the notorious BIG case and, and so, like, The Shield was basically adopted, you know, there had been all these shows for decades about, like, you know, gritty cops getting the job done and, you know, 
they get the girl and, and they, they, they sell off the case. And like the shield was one of the first shows, I think where it was kind of like, no, like <laughs> there's some bad shit that goes on <laughs> series of cases like, like that you know, training day and things like that. But and I guess the, I think the story's kind of turned a little bit, but uh, since then, which is why it's interesting that they're saying like, we shouldn't have good cop shows anymore. Cause I feel like a lot of them are, you know, have been nuanced over the past couple of years, but I don't know. I think oh, yeah. like, the the cop shows have turned to like nine one one Austin Texas you know just kind of like avoiding all static and making it's all on network television for sure right all firefighters all lawyers all this all that like no we don't want to address the the bad stuff please but but I think about a show you know like Homicide and like how that is just so nuanced how it showed like that there were like you know these good cops gone bad and just plain old, you know, you got guys like uh, Garrity, I think that was his name, is a big fat guy who just wanted to kind of sit back and do nothing. It was like a, a real racist cop. And like, it, he was just there. He wasn't necessarily sympathetic because of that, but he was a character and you, would, and you could see that character. I do think there is a place for cop shows. I think you just need more homicides. I mean, yeah, I you, you know I'm, what I mean. I'm not, I'm not giving away any secrets that, um, you know, I'm working on something with David Simon right now, and he posted a picture in the fall on Instagram uh, with uh, us in a room together and the GTTF people on the taped on the wall. So that's uh, in the works. Oh! <laughs> that's so exciting. Can you get David Simon on the show, please? <laughs> well, we can't ask that yet, Evan. You gotta be cool. All right, we'll wait two cool. years. I don't know. You gotta be cool. The show becomes a two season uh, show on HBO or something like that. Uh, David, si I mean, how much does David Simon, I, I think, uh, influence you uh, as a writer in your work on your book, like in your reporting? Because I, I mean, Homicide is one of my favorite books. The Corner is one of my favorite books, you know, uh, miniseries, TV shows, The Wire. Like, how, what, what kind of influence is he on you? I mean, he influences me, but I can't his writing is such on a different level that I can't even like try to even aspire to that. Like, and especially like homicide was written from a first person perspective and, and he was there, you know, he was there, he immersed himself in it. He was able to like have full access. I found myself actually reading history books when I was writing the story because I didn't have access to my subjects. I wasn't with, a, a, most of them would not talk. I did get some people on the inside to talk, but like I wasn't there with them. I'm relying on wiretap transcripts and videos and testimony. So like, in a way, I might as well have been writing a book about something from the 1930s. And I read David Grant's book about uh, Killers of the Flower Moon because it was set 100 years ago and he was doing it off of transcripts and, and, and you know, documents, which is what I was doing. Um, so, I mean, his writing is, you know, Simon's writing, you know, I, I was, especially when I started out the paper, I would always look up his articles in our archives. You know, have the access to these archives and some of his bigger stories, like he would write these like, you know, 4,000 word, like, you know, like amazing narrative stories about, like, there was one about like a guy who did a series of bank robberies. And so, you know, I, I tried to write narrative stories for the sun based on real life events because I wanted to do those types of things. And I, I haven't been doing as many like investigations in recent years because I want to tell stories. There's so many interesting stories in this town that like, you know, like I can go through data and Excel spreadsheets and this and that, but like, I, want, I wanted to tell stories. So, yeah, he's influenced me in that regard, but I, I can't I can't aspire to his his level of writing. Even his tweets are very Shakespearean when he's like telling someone to fuck off. <laughs> oh yeah, and he's so, very you know, dense. Yeah, in everybody language. gets a response too. <laughs> but I wanted to say earlier, in terms of referring to the density of the material of the book, I mean, there is certainly a lot to be said of it becoming like a reference textbook, you know, in in some sort of law school or something like that if it's if it's that definitive in terms of the knowledge uh, in it but as for david simon yeah man uh best of luck on that project i i we will definitely have you back on and uh if possible at some point mr david simon <laughs> yeah i hope to have more to, to share about that soon sure that'd be awesome wonderful i mean at the very least next february we will we will call you up again and i'm going to pre-order the book and i'm going to expect you to sign it and stuff <laughs> yeah definitely definitely I, personalized I hope that, message I, it's not looking too good in terms of this uh coronavirus that i might be able to have in-person events i really was hoping that this turn of the year we would but uh but we have no leadership and everything is <laughs> just take long <laughs> so yeah 
I'll get the hard cover and I'll leave it in your mailbox. Then you can sign it and I'll come get it later. Yeah, contactless uh, signing. We'll have to figure that yes. out. <laughs> you just put it put it through the mail slot and then it comes back out. <laughs> uh, all right, Justin, do you have any other closing comments before we mosey along? No, I mean, uh, what can I say? I, st I mean, support the Baltimore Sun. I hope everybody's doing well. At times are tough. Uh, go Orioles. That's all I have to say. Very good. Well done. Live, laugh, love. All right. Thanks, guys. All right, sir. I will talk to you soon. Have a great evening. Okay. All right. We will be right back after this commercial message from Kellogg's. Hi. Do you like cornflakes? Eat Kellogg's cornflakes. This has been Kellogg's. Do 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 do. Wow. All right. We're back. Guys, can we just bask in the glow of that interview for a moment or two? You know, it's nice after all this time to realize that maybe we are doing good work. Yeah, now all we need is for 10,000 people to, to agree with us. Are we doing good work or does Evan just know people? <laughs> yes, but at least we're talking to the people that Evan knows and we're not embarrassing ourselves. <laughs> good point. Yeah, I just have to keep knowing people. Although, you know, in this in this life that we're living right now, it's hard to meet new people. Oh my God, Casey is pouring himself a nice, tall, absolute vodka. In straight, straight on the rocks. Amber locked at the bedroom door. Got a vodka soda going. Ooh, top of the rim with that soda. No ice. Gross. Vodka soda or vodka tonic, Casey? Uh. I guess soda, club soda. Okay, well, yeah, then soda's the answer. Good work. Anyway, how do we close this episode before we get to uh, shut-ups? What, what, what do we do here? Because I'm kind of like, um... Oh. You're buzzing? You're, you're riding on a high? Yeah, Brian's riding. He got so hot and bothered, he had to go outside. It's, it's just hot <laughs> where I was. Well, it's, easier to, it's easier to sit around and smoke cigarettes outside. That's the glory of doing this virtually, is that I can come outside on my phone, smoke some cigs, do a podcast. It really is the platonic ideal for me. Not that you should be doing that. You really should have a virtual background that includes at least some iota of branding. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Hold on. Let's see what I can pull up real quick. <laughs> Please not. Uh, I don't think you could do that on your phone. <laughs> Virtual background. Oh, I, don't have it. I don't have anything prepared. I don't have anything prepared. Don't worry about it. All right. Uh, but since we, you know, didn't really do any cattle calls on the old fam zone, this is going to be a very short. But did we actually read the, because we have some from last time, but I can't oh, remember Evan, if Evan we did. actually did Evan did read them. The episode that I posted. I listened, Evan. I heard you read them. Okay. Actually, I did not read them. Hannah read them. I read them. Well, you know, you know what I mean. I did terrible. <laughs> At least remember that it happens. <laughs> At any rate, it is now time to get a little angry. Uh, time to get a little burnt out. Uh, there, I, I feel like I'm leaning on a certain uh, artistic medium with my shut-ups, but I have one this week. Okay. Time to get a little piss out. Uh, 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 uh. Uh. Yeah, thank you. Time to go right ahead and tell everybody to shut up. All right, this is the end of our very, very fine episode of the CTV show in which we give the opposite of mad props, aka shut ups, to uh, persons, places, and things that are uh, lowering our quality of life and not giving us jollies. What do we got, gang? So Casey, I'm gonna do a little. You go first? Casey, I got. Go I'm gonna first? do a little brown nosing in my shut up. Um, shut up oh. to Justin's book not coming out to February because oh, I just want to read it right oh, now. Boy. You putz. You want me to give him <laughs> your, his phone number so you can just electronically fillet him? Eh. Ask him how he liked episodes of The Bachelor, that sort of thing. I mean, <laughs> that 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 would be uh, your mo. <laughs> see, uh, I'm curious. What he thinks? There's a new Bachelorette. I don't think he watches. I don't think he has time. He's a but busy no, guy. I've got, I've got, I've got the book pre-ordered. I'm, I'm ready to go. Oh, you already did it. You already pre-ordered. Yeah, I already pre-ordered the book. 
Casey, you love merch. <laughs> no, that's art. That is art. That's right. Merch is art anyway. I got to shut up. My shut up this week is to the program known as Labor of Love. What a shitty ending. And also, if you read online what happened after the ending, it's hilarious. This seems like something I would say. For, for the uninitiated, what is Labor of Love? Labor of Love is which they take a female contestant that was on The Bachelor and she wants to get pregnant, so there's a bunch of bachelors that want to have a baby mama and they they do various dates and things like that and formulaically it works exactly like The Bachelor or The Bachelorette except their intent is to have a baby. Um, well, wait, this girl, was already, uh, this girl was already on The Bachelor? Who is she? Uh... I don't remember her name, but she was she's 41 now, so it was in 2006 she was Gross. on the Bachelor. But everyone on the show is basically bland and unmemorable. That's why I don't remember. Wait, you, wait you're watching this show from 2006? No, it's it's from this year. Oh, gotcha. On Fox. It's, well, it's done now. Gotcha. Thank God! Shut up! Okay. All right, it's my turn. I feel like last week or a couple weeks ago or something, I gave a shout-out to some hearing aids with a commercial that I really liked. Well, this week, I'm giving a shut up to two commercials that I really hate. And these are commercials from Burger King and Popeyes. And they lean on the concept of food bloggers and they are both annoying as fuck and I hate them so much. Like there's this one where there's like, the Burger King one is like, we asked these food bloggers to come and get a surprise. And like one girl's like, are you telling me that I'm getting two Whopper sandwiches for $5? <laughs> and then there's another guy who's like, I'm going to leave before you change your mind. And then there's another guy like, two Whopper sandwiches for $5? This has to be a mistake. And I'm like, these are food bloggers? These are the food bloggers? And then there's another one for the Popeye's chicken sandwich. And I'm just so bored of this chicken sandwich. And there's like a guy who's like, look at your beautiful self in the crispy golden chickeny form and i'm like shut the fuck up yeah Yo. uh i would i would, hate those commercials i want to piggyback another one of those commercials on the under the checkers commercials where it's the two guys that are basically it's just two copies of the guy and they're like out on a, a, a fast foodie date and he's talking to basically his oh so not the sonic commercials because those guys are funny those are okay, but no, this checkers one is really bad where it's like the guy is out on a date with himself and they're just both eating checkers. Um, also, I hate hey. all those goddamn YouTube videos where the people are just sitting in their car eating food and they're like, fast food review, Burger King Whopper. Oh, shit, it is so good. I can't believe it. Hey, hey I, I have a question. I have a question. If you said there is a guy and he's like on a date with himself. Yeah. If you were to like time travel back like three days and yeah. meet yourself. Okay. And then you fuck yourself. <laughs> because, because, you know, you're like, well, I know how I like it and I can do these things. Oh, okay. Is that gay or is that masturbation? How do you, you can't F yourself without, no, I refuse. <laughs> <laughs> it's been shut ups. <laughs> send send your answers to <laughs> send your answers to the CTV fan zone extreme or uh -huh. Evan at city that breeds com. Oh no, that that no longer exists. Feel free to. Oh, well, feel free to include any diagrams or pictures that you'd like. Oh, I forgot a, uh, a shut-up that was sent via text. It's a uh, shut-up to creepy guys on Facebook uh, Marketplace. Well, listen, maybe I just want to know, along with that free 42-inch... Shut, shut up to Brian and uh, no Wi-Fi heaven. Jesus uh, Christ. TV, You're writing so high. So high, bro. So high. I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, all right. This has been episode 320, I believe, six, possibly seven of the CTB 
dot show go to ctb dot show and find the episode that casey did not listen to under the ctb presents feed it's entitled a refreshing firm crisp grape uh, brian's just completely gone all right well, i'm still here i'm still here <laughs> i was uh intending on posting all of this video because there you know there's some graphics going on but uh maybe i'll reconsider just kidding i'm gonna post this whole thing because it's great uh, all right. Thank you very much for watching and or listening. Thank you very much for being a friend. Thank we you. forgot to ask Fenton to to uh, plug his his Twitter account. Oh, I think both him and both him and his beard. I think at least <laughs> I think at least twenty eight thousand people know about his Twitter account. So uh, maybe we'll. What about his beard? Up. All right. Have a great day and a better tomorrow.